what I see as um, the real the real thing that ha that Occupy has accomplished so far, which is changing the conversation um, nationally um, and locally, especially. Um, so uh, there's a there's a huge breadth within the Occupy movement um, of uh, what I see as I guess the the spectrum of uh, people who want to tax the rich and people who want to eat the rich. Um, <laughs> reformers and revolutionaries and everyone in between. Um, and, uh, and so I think we've probably got uh, quite a spectrum just on this panel. Um, so I'm gonna let everyone introduce themselves um, and talk about um, kind of your background in, in organizing and um, what you've been uh, involved with within Occupy so far. Hi, I'm Phoebe Sorgan and as for my background in organizing, I've served on the KPFA board, I've been a Berkeley Peace and Justice Commissioner, and I wrote Berkeley's two resolutions to abolish corporate personhood, which were then copied by um, Richmond, California last year, passed unanimously, and Albany just uh, earlier this month, and Marina, California. So that's spreading, and now we're working on ballot initiatives uh, to make it even stronger. Um, and as far as my involvement with Occupy, I started out with Occupy Freedom Plaza in DC. Last June, I signed the pledge to come to DC and be there on October 6th when that was launched. And, um, and then I also visited the, and went to some workshops at McPherson Square, the other Occupy DC. So that was thrilling to be a part of, of those first steps and, um, and ongoing. And then when I came back home, I got involved a little bit with Occupy Oakland and San Francisco. And finally, I live here in Berkeley, so finally I got involved with Occupy Berkeley in November and pretty much gave it all of my free time um, until that encampment was, was shut down. Um, and it continues, there continue to be lots of activities and general assemblies and there are flyers on the back table there um, that show some of the things that are happening, like the knit-in and the sit-in that's every week, um, the McDonald's action that's coming up on March 4th, and um, also the, um, all of the occupiers are participating in the May 1 general strike, and um, Earth Day actions are big with the occupiers in the East Bay. Thank you. My name is Maria Gastelumendi. I am the owner of the Rising Gopher Cafe and Bakery that is located at the center, uh, the heart of uh, Franco Gawa Plaza where Occupy has made its home. So um, as an immigrant, I wanted to have a life in Oakland and I established uh, a food service industry that could uh, sell food that was healthy and affordable and very oriented in the conservation of the environment. So when Occupy came to my neighborhood, I was very interested in knowing who they were. And I find out that there were a lot of issues that we had a uh, commonality with. And uh, in my, my fight to try to convince people about what is the difference between fast food and healthy food, uh, that for years I was trying to send, suddenly Occupy came and there you were, people understanding much easily what is to be supporting a local business, uh, supporting the local currency, and, uh, and I felt that uh, they basically spoke my issues. So I made home for them and uh, I, I, we created a committee, the, lo the local business liaison committee that had network with many other committees at, in Occupy, and although you don't see the occupiers physically in Franco Gawa Plaza, there are lots of meetings that are going on, working on issues that the media is not too interested in publicizing, and I'm not going to repeat the, what uh, Phoebe already said, these are projects that are on an ongoing basis. And, uh, and I feel very uh, empowered and very optimistic and especially with hope that just last year, I, did, I noticed people didn't have. So Occupy had brought hope to us. So um, with that, I will. Hi, my name is Sarah Meisner, and I just wanted to start by saying thank you for um, coming here today and sharing space with us. It's really a privilege to sit in community with 
other folks in Berkeley in the Bay Area. Um, so at present, I am involved with Occupy Oakland, and um, the way that I engage in the Occupy Oakland community is I'm on the facilitation committee. So I'm basically like a secretary to Occupy. And um, additionally, in, in addition to that work, I also um, engage in the Occupy for Prisoners. And if you hadn't seen that or participated in it this last Monday, we had a demonstration in front of San Quentin, which was to raise awareness about the issues facing currently incarcerated peoples, um, and now people on parole or in detainment centers or in juvenile halls. And it was just a phenomenal demonstration. We had about 1,000 people there, um, and it was beautiful. One of the most diverse demonstrations that I've seen um, to date, being engaged in Occupy Oakland, um, and diversity on many different, um, you know, many different indicators by diversity, not just age or race or gender, but also socioeconomic class, um, immigrants. This was a really exciting day. Um, the historical experiences that I have that led me to the work that I'm doing now include a lifetime of service. I've been engaged in service and activism since uh, my mom says I was like three years old. <laughs> and um, yeah, which wasn't easy for them, right? And, uh, um, but I do have what I like to call like my dirty little secret in the Bay Area, which is I worked um, as a Republican campaigner and fundraiser for about four years of my life. And I worked on Bill Jones' gubernatorial campaign, and I worked for a uh, fundraising <coughs> film in Sacramento, Wendy Warfield and Associates, and I worked um, fundraising for George W. And um, then I came out to the Bay Area. Oh, actually, I should say that those, those experiences are the experiences that radicalized me. <laughs> because, because I actually um, was sort of seen as this like apprentice and was invited into all of these meetings and got to see how money and, and um, the elite are running our country and was just completely um, broken hearted by that. So um, I had the privilege of going to school at UC Berkeley and having a peace and service fellowship and engaging in uh, many different forms of service in the Bay Area. And um, I just, as, as part of my introduction, I have to say that I think the most beautiful part about Occupy that I've seen thus far is that we can carry our political beliefs, our political ideologies, and the minute that you carry those into community, they are forced to change, and you are forced to change. And it's not always comfortable, but there are beautiful transformations that are occurring in our communities, and that's what I'm most excited about. Hey everybody, uh, my name's Scott, I'm from Occupy SF. Um, forgive me, I woke up with OccuCough this morning, so I'm a little, uh, <laughs> gonna be having cough drops throughout the session. Um, but uh, I, uh, I always joke that I'm here from the internet, because um, I was always into cyber activism, there was never really a community I felt that I could plug into uh, that would kind of fit all, my, all the things I'm passionate about. And then one day last July, I saw that poster that was <coughs> Adbusters was floating around with the ballerina on the Wall Street Bulls back. And I heard it that they said Occupy Wall Street, and something about that just spoke to me more than anything in my life. Because really, you know, there's a lot of things that you know we could definitely improve on as a society, but getting money out of politics and you know taking on the banks that are just kind of destroying communities—that's really important. Cool. <laughs> um, but uh, so one day in mid-September, I heard that there was uh, Occupy Wall Street had actually started, and uh, they were in San Francisco. So I went down and never looked back. And my whole life's been that for about four months now, so five months, however long it's been. Um, so yeah, it's a good time. Just thanks for being here, everybody. So I guess my first question for everyone would be um, kind of uh, uh, off of what something that Phoebe said about um, resolutions to abolish or uh, you know against Citizens United from local governments. Um, and something that uh, I've seen in Occupy um, is uh, a sense of demanding change not asking for permission from local governments. But at the same time, what you're talking about, Sarah, is um, not demanding change from the community, um, conversing with the community. Um, and so I'm wondering if you guys could speak to uh, how, you, how, you, uh, how you see that sort of dynamic working where you're demanding change from the government, but you are, you are uh, asking permission from the communities. It sounds to me like you hit the nail on the head, Sarah. We, what we need, of course, is a huge, and this Occupy is doing this more than anything in the last 40 years, a huge growing movement of resistance. 
And the way we do that is by being inviting to more participation from the community in demanding change, because we're not going to get the change by asking politely. Thanks. Yeah, historically, uh, Phoebe just uh, nailed, <laughs> nailed the cover. Uh, historically, the people who have everything are not voluntarily going to say, let's share what, uh, what I have. We have seen in the last 30 years how our economy has been degraded, our environment has been destroyed mm -hmm. one by one. We thought in, when uh, Obama took over and he continued to bail out the banks, we thought that that was to going to solve our problems, that was going to offer uh, keeping people on their jobs, saving our economies. But what is happening now, more people are losing their jobs. More people are, uh, 20, uh, 25 million of people are unemployed. That is a staggering number. So what is left to the people who are trying to have some hope? We need to ask very seriously because we are not being heard if we are going to wait for people to make, to, for the government to make the changes. There are corporations that have a lot of power and influence on our government, and they have their ears, and we don't have any chances to have the, the power to lobby as those people lobby to our government. So our government is completely sold out. Both, both parties are completely sold out to the corporations. How are we going to defend ourselves? But by speaking very loudly, by uniting our voice, and Occupy has given us that chance. The other thing about our community, if we, if we don't build networks with the people who are lost completely from this uh, empire of rich elites, if we are not counting for them, then we need to get together. We need to speak and recognize what our, are our issues and support each other. And that is what Occupied is offering us. People of all sorts of ages, ethnicities, backgrounds, even people who were in crime have turned into activists in Occupied. It is an amazing change that I never thought I was going to, to see in my life. We now have with everyone, and everyone feels that is part of the movement. I don't know if I diverted from it. Yeah, I'm a little afraid that we'll get too far away from your question. Yeah, stay close. Stay close. <laughs> oh, um, well, with regards to, I think, just the way that we see change, I think we, it, what is important to remember is that Occupy isn't something that has just sprung up out of nowhere. Um, those who have created, collaborated, and are participating in this this space are actually long-term community members and part of community <laughs> organizations. And, and now finally, Occupy is providing this, this platform for deep and, and transformative collaboration. So while um, there are some aspects of it that are obviously, you know, reformists are engaging in what we call government to make these sort of, um, you know, small incremental changes, we also have people sort of at the, the other end of the spectrum or, or perhaps the other supporting arm of the, the octopus or however, whatever metaphor you'd like to use that is actually saying, hey, we've, this thing that we're calling government um, has not been responsive to its citizens or to people inhabiting this space since it has existed. And we've had people fighting and fighting and fighting to be a part of it, but it, it necessarily isn't very responsive. So I think that there's also an arm of Occupy that is looking at what is governance and then how are we <coughs> governing ourselves. Um, and when we have been, unfortunately, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 28 and I'm looking at my brothers and sisters in my generation and the insidious forms of capitalism have destroyed our understanding of relationship. And instead, you know, the men of my generation are more used to playing video games than they are having in being in conversation and being in community. Um, so I think what, what Occupy is providing space for um, is for a broad spectrum of um, diversity of responses to how we are going to respond to the critical issues of our time. Um, so from my perspective, uh, 
we we don't ask for permission to protest. Um, we demand change um, because you know we didn't ask the banks to come in and destroy our communities. We didn't ask for the economy to collapse and millions of people to be out of work. The government doesn't listen, and you just see it on the news every day. This bank's getting bailed out, or you know, only 55 investigators on the Wall Street economic collapse team when you know there was 100 for this and more for the savings and loan uh, back in the 80s. Um, so you know we didn't we didn't ask the, the our communities to be destroyed. We didn't ask for the country to be you know this way where uh, you know the storm the socioeconomic perfect storm that we find ourselves in where this movement is so successful. Um, we don't we don't go for by the permit process. That's just a way to you know deny you your ability to assemble and exercise your free speech. So we don't ask for permission. But at the same time, we try to be when we go out into communities, we try to be sensitive to their needs to to not alienate them because they've already been alienated from their government. They've already been alienated from you know a lot of parts of their society because they you know it's, you can't move up anymore. It's you, you move down in society. There's no the American dream is you know it's there is none anymore. Uh, your you know the dream seems just to be to make it day to day. Um, so we're for the first time for a lot of people we're the first spark of hope they've known because um, we're just regular people that kind of got together and we're you know, doing amazing stuff. Um, we've already, like we've mentioned before, we've already changed the national conversation um, without asking for permission. You never, uh, you never get equality or, or anything by asking for permission because nobody's gonna give up their power. So, um, but we're gonna definitely keep doing it because spring's here now, so. And that's really what it all comes down to is, is power. And what Occupy has done is, uh, is change the power dynamic. It's created um, a decentralized movement that decentralizes power and creates new points of power that, um, that anyone can take, that people can take. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering how, uh, how do people in this room who may not be involved in Occupy take that sort of power? How do they um, become empowered by Occupy even though they are not in Occupy, how does uh, that platform benefit everyone who might have something in common with the movement? I would say that the single biggest achievement is Occupy uh, of Occupy is increasing hope. Um, how many of you have been in organizations that have asked the question, "How can we grow the movement?" That, um, yeah, that, see my big, I decided over 10 years ago, I was working on so many issues, eco, peace, various justice issues, uh, abolishing the death penalty and so forth. And I finally decided I had to focus and what's the single most important thing I can work on. And I decided it was ending corporate personhood and ending corporate rule in general because the corp corpocracy versus democracy issue seems to be key to so much else. And, um, and we've had progress on that front. But then I came to the realization about a year ago that the real issue is how to build the movement, a massive movement of resistance. And I started collecting books and articles on that topic and was about to start a book group and discussion group on learning how to grow the movement. And then bingo. Occupy happened, a dream come true. And we found out that these young people that we thought were not informed, that we thought were apathetic, um, whoa, they've got it. And they were not informed by Fox News and CNN and the massive media, but they were getting the real news from the internet and elsewhere. And they not only got it, but they were motivated and activated. So um, that has just lifted our hopes so much. and. As far as what any of you in this room who have not been involved with Occupy can do, um, just jump in. Whatever issue is dearest to your heart, you can find a way to work with one of the local Occupy movements to further that issue. So look on the websites, go to meetings, connect with people, and you will find support. Something that was um, something that is very interesting in my encounter with people in my daily life, and when they know that I am involved with Occupy, this this um, this necessity to tell me what is Occupy doing right or wrong, 
and uh, and I and I felt like I have to answer and I have to say something and I don't know really what to say because I although I am across from occupied I am involved in a few committees and I do my best to understand my own issues that are being spoken very loudly by occupied how can you people be part of occupied create a committee find out what is what you are bothered about and talk to other people get together with the occupiers and suddenly you will have a committee and then other committees will support your cause and then you will have a loud voice well, there what is I, what i'm actually interested in is how they can do things that what does occupy uh, do that uh, that makes it possible for these people to not be a part of occupy mm -hmm. but do things outside of occupy that are also very powerful because of what occupy has done nationally opening things up um, I have one example. Uh, I, think, I think I can I can use this example. There is this uh, this news stand in downtown Oakland called The Lords, and it's there since 1907. And uh, we find out by customers that go to The Lords that the new owner of the building had hand an eviction letter to the lords, although he was still legally one year away from his, uh, within his lease. The new owner of the building had sold, bought the business, the building, and signed a lease with 7-Eleven. Oh. The lords didn't ask us because was afraid that the owner of the building was going to maybe make it impossible for, for him to negotiate. But we got the news, and we told, promise we are not going to say it's occupied. But we went to the city and find out what was the process of these uh, this, uh, permits that the city needs to issue to 7-Eleven. And all the arguments that we have about supporting <coughs> local businesses, supporting the quality and the culture and the, and the uniqueness of Oakland work perfectly well. All those arguments were heard by the city and the city denied the permit to 7-Eleven. Now the owner of the building needs to figure out how is he going to negotiate with 7-Eleven and the lawyers of 7-Eleven to cancel that lease. The owner of, of the lawyers had just benefited from what occupied. Uh, the presence of Occupy. I love, I love when Maria tells the story. What she doesn't say is that they say to her, like, oh, well, 7-Eleven is a much more um, stable. Sta right? stable. Yeah. She's like, Dolores is 100 years old. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, how much more stable do you want? <laughs> um, I, I, like, I like this question because I think it asks what... I should ask you, like, how many of you feel empowered by Occupy? Like, like do you? I mean, I, then I think that it doesn't really require us to answer that question necessarily. Um, I think what's more interesting is for me to consider um, what does empowerment mean now at this stage of where we are in the, in the struggle or in our organizing or what we want to see for this world. And I think about in the last, you know, 15, 20 years with this hyperdevelopment of micro um, loans. And you know we're trying to invent new ways to engage more people or introduce more people into this global market system, which is going to empower you. We're taking more mothers away from raising their kids so that they can work too, so that they can be part of the global economy too. And what we're seeing um, from that model of empowerment is global suicides. Um, or what we see from you know other ideas around empowerment is you know to talk on this panel because that's the only way that I, as a woman, feel comfortable sitting in front of a panel in front of you, right? So is that empowerment? I think, I think, I think what Occupy is also doing is shifting our cultural consciousness to really challenge what empowerment, how we envision that and think about it. Um, additionally, after working last year um, for a small philanthropic foundation in San Francisco, um, I think if I would have heard that question, I would have thought, okay, how does this help us meet our bottom line? 
How does this, how is this gonna make, uh, how does being involved in Occupy, or are we gonna be involved in Occupy, gonna meet our, what the board is looking for, right? And that's a, like, I'm just gonna say it, that's BS. <laughs> it's absolute BS. And how many of us are doing that in our workplaces, or in our daily relationships, right? And it's like, where the hell did our values, our principles go? Like, I, I work for a small philanthropic foundation, and we were spending millions of dollars so the CEO could fl uh, fly around the world first class. So we could buy his nice suits to go to all these fancy meetings. And here we were advocating that we're, oh, we're, we're here for peace and service. I was like, that's a line of BS. So we, I think it's what Occupy is also doing culturally, not just politically, is saying, where are our values? Where are our principles? And how do those values and principles connect us in relationship with other people? And, and, and does that feel empowering? Hey, uh, so um, from my perspective, uh, especially on welcome team in SF when we had our camp, um, I actually fielded this question a lot, like what can, you know, similar to questions like how can Occupy help us for this organization or whatnot? And what I, a typical thing I usually said was, you know, whatever, you know, we got our foot in the door. We were the foot in the door, it's open. They're freaking out behind the door, so this is your chance to, you know, strike and boycott and, you know, blockade the poor and whatever you need to do to get your cause out. And, and the thing is with Occupy is it's, you don't need a rubber stamp, you don't need our rubber stamp to protest. Um, you know, if you're feeling empowered and you've got people behind you and you wanna go do an action, but you want our support and you want our numbers, come to the General Assembly, you know. Um, there's, there's ways we can help each other. Um, you know, in this, but you don't, you know, the thing is, is, is you don't need us anymore. Like where um, the doors open and like I said, they're, um, it's, our, it's the perfect time for us to just act and, and regardless of what you're, you know, it, it, I think it's been brought up earlier too, you know, you come to the General Assembly and you talk and um, if, even if you think it's just important to you, you're gonna find five, six, 10 other people who actually have that cause. Um, where that's near and dear to their heart too. This is just this movement strong. Everyone who's been disenfranchised and um, you know left behind and you know by all the other political movements. Um, so it's really just it's just this perfect you know perfect storm, perfect agglomeration of just um, everybody uh, and every and the movement is all. It's just it's just everybody's and anybody's. It's not there's we're I, we don't say we're leader less, we're leader full because as we mentioned earlier, everyone's a leader and it's it is all about empowerment. It's the first time on the in. I don't know, in my life I felt empowered to you know, go out and stand up in front of a bunch of people and do this panel or you know, talk to the press or anything like that. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, potential. I mean, this is really, it's, it's, the time, it's, it's time for change. So um, it's more like, um, uh, you know, let's, let's help each other. Let's, um, you know, we can help you. We've got numbers, we've got you know, press you know, right there. Um, and uh, you know, at the same time, you, uh, there's a lot of um, perspective that we don't have because uh, you know some some of you might have might be in organizations that have been you know advocating for a change or for a certain cause for 30 odd years and we don't know much about that because we're just you know we're coming from our very background so we can, there's a lot of ways we can help each other too but uh, the important thing is to you know we have to talk we have to talk first so that's what the part of what this panel's about so now that we've established that you don't need occupy do you have any questions for occupy <laughs> <laughs> associated with it in, in most people's eyes. Now, those of us who have participated at all know there's a very small percentage of people who knows if they're provocateurs provided by some work of an agency, but um, that's another story. Um, how, how do we deal with this problem now that many people uh, spurred on by the Fox News types uh, think that Occupy movement is, the message is getting lost, so uh, messages are how do you think we should deal with that? I preface by this panel by saying that I didn't really want this to turn into let's all talk about the, the provocateurs and the black bloc and the shields and the thrown bottles because I feel like that's all that these conversations about Occupy turn into. Um, and, and I would, I would I mean, unless anyone really would like, if, if you'd like to respond, I just, I just think that, um, I mean, certainly as a journalist covering Occupy, I'm frustrated that that's all that anyone wants to talk to me about as well. Um, I think that there's a lot that can be done um, just in the conversation if we just talk about the other things that are important. Um, 
st- at, at, I think that the media plays a big part in uh, in proliferating that um, that sort of perspective on Occupy, and I don't think that it's just Fox News. I think that it's absolutely every bit of the media. It's the progressive media too. They are totally buying into that, and they don't show up. They don't go there, and they don't see what happens. So. Um, Personally, as a reporter, I think that a lot of that stuff is just uh, is just blatantly untrue. Um, but Sarah, if you'd like to if you'd like to respond at all, yeah, I mean it's it's not working. I can tell you that much. I mean, it's what is not working. Uh, the the black eye. I mean, I think that we get caught up in it, um, but by and large, we have overwhelming support. I mean, the Oakland Tribune just did a poll and it received out of I think there were ten thousand voters. Yeah. And it had a 94, like 94 percent of the people that participated support o- what Occupy is doing in their communities. Um, it's a it's a problem per se, but it's a problem that we face across everything that we are engaged in at present and in every aspect of our life. So it's not unique to Occupy. So then it's I think a much larger question of how are we dealing with like media violence in our communities, and how are we dealing with um, blockages of communication in our communities. So. I think just reframing it, but it's, it's really not working, and I'm not too preoccupied with it. It would look like in very um, you know, direct action, or do we go more in changing policy, working within the government, getting ourselves elected, or to stay on the outside? Where do we go, let's say, within the next year for specific work through Occupy, using that as the vehicle locally and nationally? How do we sustain ourselves around this group? The beauty of Occupy is the diversity. And so some people within and without Occupy will go towards a more reformist, uh, working to change legislation and to elect better people. And I think most people in Occupy are probably not that interested in electoral politics and will be working outside of that system. And it's all good. We need it all. As a member of the small, locally owned business community in Oakland, I am part of a few organizations that are focused in uh, sustainability, in local currency, in uh, supporting the local economy, the local growers. Uh, Oakland Grown uh, had lunch uh, at the end of last year. Uh, Oakland Grown is is an organization I am part of. I am in the steering committee, and it's an organization that supports indie businesses. Uh, they had, we had launched our first project, the gift cards. And what the gift cards is that we have done is presented at the General Assembly. And Occupied had approved, supported, and now oh, it is in the website of Occupy, inviting other occupiers to also uh, model the gift card that Oakland Grown had launched. And, uh, and move on with the, uh, sustainab- the sustainability of our communities. Uh, I am also part of the Sustainable Business Alliance, which is part of Occupy. We, uh, we have uh, organizations uh, nationwide, the, uh, the American uh, Amoeba. Um, Amoeba, and uh, there are two organizations that is, uh, do policy issues at, uh, at the sustainable uh, with sustainable issues, and uh, and they they are working not directly with Occupy, I would say, but because Occupy uh, had supported Oakland Grown in an indirect way, we are also working together. I don't know how it's in other cities because I can only uh, work with the, the, uh, as a local business, I am really involved in the local economy. So I can't speak for Berkeley or Waddle Creek, but, uh, <coughs> but in Auckland, uh, the sustainability issue is our priority. Um, I wonder if you can talk about general assemblies. I wonder how many people here have actually been to a general assembly. Are they still meeting, and where and when? Sarah. As the secretary of no. um, <laughs> Yes, we're having one today. Uh, 2 o'clock, uh, 19th and Telegraph, and um, that's, o- that's Oakland's General Assembly. I can't speak for the other um, occupies in the Bay Area, but I do, I'm, 
I've got so much love for Open GA um, because we do get folks from all over the Bay Area. People are really showing up and coming out. Um, and and the General Assembly is only one of the tools. I, I personally don't like to fetishize it, even even though I do have the heart for it. Um, but it's only one of the tools, and what it's really functioning as right now in our community is just a meeting, a meeting place for all of the different affinity groups to kind of come together and say, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. And the kitchen committee always shows up with lunch, which is phenomenal. Um, but I will say it's a really good plug-in point. It's a really, if you haven't been to one before, it's a really good opportunity to kind of come down and say, hey, I'm, I'm Joe or I'm Tim, and how can I get involved? Sarah does a great job when she facilitates of keeping everyone in line. Um, Occupy SF still has general assemblies. Um, they're meeting at 101 Market out inside the Fed. Um, and uh, they do uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. But since we didn't, we don't have a camp anymore. We don't, we don't have anything to talk about every day, so we only do it twice a week. But all the working groups still meet, uh, generally at the Drum Street Starbucks because they love us there. Um, they still meet almost every day. Um, so there's still a lot going on, and the general assemblies are we uh, we've been reforming and remodeling the process because uh, it was growing. Uh, you know, we're not no, none of us are really experienced with direct democracy before. You know, you, no one tells you you have to get your hands dirty. You know, everyone thinks you're going to walk in and it's just going to be this cakewalk and we're going to vote and feel amazing. But, you know, you're, that's why the word stakeholder is in consensus process is important because you've got a stake in the decision. So there's a lot of emotions. And that's one thing. If you're going to come to a general assembly for your first time, you know, just kind of keep in mind it's going to be, it's going to seem like everybody's hating each other and arguing, but it's not. It's just a passionate form of debate. Um, but, yeah, the general assemblies are still going on. And even in, yeah, we don't, um, it's more like a meeting spot. We just, the working groups check in in San Francisco as well. Um, and we consent on different things. A lot of uh, the issue we're having in San Francisco, I don't know if others are having it, but apparently every activist group now thinks they need our stamp of approval to, in order to protest. So they all come to us and want, and it's just like, no, no, you know, as I was saying earlier, you know, keep doing what you've been doing, you know, it's been working, you know, uh, you know, come to us and tell us what's happening and we can bring numbers. But uh, yeah, general assemblies are, I don't know, they're, they're changing, they're interesting. It's interesting to see where they're gonna go from, from here. So uh, a little while ago, I know uh, you talked about like all the negative stuff, and you know, like I'm sure everyone here has heard about that. Uh, can you guys briefly talk about uh, some of the good that maybe we're not seeing on the news or in the newspaper and stuff uh, for those of us that aren't super involved with the movement? I. Uh I, I don't know if you would perceive these things as good. I can just tell you what ha what's been happening in the last week. Um, there is uh, upcoming, tomorrow is gonna be a national day of Occupy the Food System. A lot of food justice groups getting involved in that and they've been meeting very consistently over the past couple of months. No one talks about them. Um, people have been uh, people have been protesting banks directly, going and protesting banks. People have been shutting down foreclosure auctions on the steps of the Alameda County Courthouse and getting arrested. Nobody talks about them. Um, I, I, people are uh, defending foreclosures um, and trying to get um, people to actually get back inside their houses. Um, also, not in the news. Uh, yeah, that's just for Occupy. I, I mean, I, I think that there's a whole lot going on. I think that the food justice stuff is actually um, really, really interesting because there are also a lot of the people that are involved in Occupy the Food System locally are um, are also working with other uh, nonprofits and other um, local groups around food justice. They're already plugged into that, those issues um, within the community already, and then they're bringing that stuff to Occupy, which I think is very, very interesting and, and something that I don't think the public generally perceives Occupy to be doing. Thank you for that excellent question. I want to refer people to that Occupy stands against the starvation of our people, the lo losing our homes, and um, the, the violence of this society is what Occupy is standing up against. And that is far more problematic, of course, than the minimal vandalism that the 1% of occupiers who engage in, in vandalism, which in property damage is not violence. Come on. So anyway, um, in, in Rebecca Solnit's um, article, she lists some recent victories, and those are what we need to be talking about. Um, the, how the, the campaign against corporate personhood is gaining momentum, and there was Occupy the Courts on January. We were surrounded by these uh, uh, sharpshooters from the roofs of San Quentin, and hundreds of guards and police and cops 
that were waiting for us to make a mistake, and this nonviolent caucus, which is a fantastic organization of people, had come to our help to help us to conduct our marches in a most organized way. So that is how I would call working with uh, local organizations. I I think as a as a young person um, being uh, being engaged in this, I think we have to be very careful about how we think that terms like I mean I know I'm sitting at a panel and we're at the Progressive Opportunities Conference, but let's get real here. Like there's plenty of people that are, do not identify as progressive and are doing the most radical and progressive work in our communities, and um, I think we need to be very careful about the way that we talk about these things and talk about like what an an alliance actually looks like and what collaboration actually looks like, rather than just like kind of, you know, musing around these terms. I would say that Occupy is still r a baby. I mean, we're just still in our diapers. You know, it's like, we're still not potty trained. Um, <laughs> so, you know, organizers that have been working in Move On, like I, I can't foresee that there won't be collaboration with the problems that we're facing. I mean, <coughs> my, my redneck uncle who lives in Bakersfield is now, you know, who's identified as a Republican his whole life is saying, how do I get involved with Occupy? <laughs> so, I mean, I think, I think that it's a, it's a much more open platform that we've got going for us right now and it's a really beautiful thing. Um, uh, to answer your question, uh, in San Francisco we've actually, uh, each city's like taking different approaches. I guess it depends on the, the makeup of your city and the people that live there. But like in San Francisco, since day one, we've been you know heavily involved with a lot of progressive organizations. Uh, MoveOn.org. Some sometimes they'll meet with us and we'll schedule actions, or other times they'll just put out an email like, "Oh, we're going to start a march at Occupy SF." And um, but we do a lot of work. There's now the the spokes council that meets in Occupy SF. Uh, it meets Sundays in um, I think in the library. Uh, but that's that's a coalition of progressive groups. Um, they're not necessarily affiliated. They're allied with Occupy SF, um, but they're um, uh, that they're they set a spokesperson from each group, um, or some of them are like allied. Um, you know, they'll, they're speaking on behalf of two or three groups. That's what, how the Occupy Wall Street West action was planned on January 20th, was through this um, the spokes council and this huge alliance of of groups. And like Occupy the food system, that's not necessarily Occupy. A lot of that was started by like. Um, you know, a food activist like Frances Moore LePay, I think you pronounce her name. She wrote Dying for a Balanced Planet. Um, and there's a lot of stuff like that. And they've, they've come into the fold and they're, um, you know, they're working with Occupy, but it's, it's um, you know, uh, they're using us as a vehicle, basically. Um, and it's, it's a symbiotic relationship because there's, you know, the, there's a lot of uh, people that are coming to us from organizations where they're not happy because the, the organizations aren't necessarily as active as they'd like. Um, and then there's people that find Occupy too active, but they're using, they're finding ways into different organizations uh, that they can get involved in. Because um, there's, there's a lot of talk, at least in, in, in SF, there's a lot of talk and um, cooperation between the two, the two entities, we'll say. You know, there, you still have a lot more questions, but we don't have any more time. But um, thanks everyone for, for coming. <laughs>